Boop. Hello, guys. Welcome back to Chess of Blades. Let us start with this Renaissance romance drama. Sorry, I'm just really, really excited to get back to Let's Plays. Oh my god. Although, thesis, a lot of thesis next week, so it's gonna be a bitch cramming everything. Ooh, music to my ears. Like, literally, I'm playing with headphones. So, let's begin, shall we? Oh, load. I really need to update my obs. It might solve the blacking out of the save files of the chess of, of RenP saves in the menu. Anyway, triple dot. <sighs> I'm sorry, what's happening? What is that infernal noise? I'm sorry, what? Oh. Is there a way to... Hold on. The text. Skipping scene text. Oh, they can save screenshots. Although, last time I tried that, it didn't work out too well. Sir? Sir, are you awake? <gasps> <gasps> Really? <gasps> no, I'm naked! I bolt upright, rubbing at my eyes hastily. That's right. I'm trapped in this castle of death for our so-called celebration. But more importantly, is that whose voice I think it is? Don't tell me this is gonna be one of those games where it's the butler who did it. I grab a pillow from the bed and hold it in front of my legs for modesty's sake. Are you naked? Then storm over to the door to unlock and fling it open. What the Sir, I Sir, apologize for... You damn sorry excuse for a butler or manservant or whatever the hell you are. You shoved that little girl onto me last night and she ran off before I could do anything. But I doubt your evil heart gives a damn if she gets 30 lashes for going places she's not supposed to. My accusation makes Silas Silas blink, his expression more curious than the sheepish one I was expecting. But sir, the girl was safe and sound back in the kitchens by the time her mother returned. Perhaps she merely wanted a brief glimpse of the splendor, and then went back? back? <clears throat> Is that really where she went? Well, it's not like it's my business. Still, any first-time nanny would feel bad about losing track of their charge. Damn it, I'm a man of noble blood, not a nanny! Well, uh, that's fine. Fine then, I suppose. Uh, sorry, sorry for you. you. Silas offers me a sly smile, shaking his head with a gentle wave of his hand. There is no need to apologize, sir. I stopped by just to inform you that the festival has started. The first day is often the best, they say. And I would not wish for you to miss out. However, I humbly recommend that you attend the event in more than a pillow. The lady should surely appreciate it, but it would be most cold. I don't need you to tell me that, you know. Uh, go on, go and attend to your butler duties. I see. I show him off with my non-pillow holding hand, my face burning a little as I slam the door and retreat back into my room. Damn right the ladies would appreciate it. Probably that creepy fellow from last night too. Oh, I would appreciate that! Oh, ho, oh, oh. ho! Tossing the pillow aside, I set about dressing myself, muttering all the while. Well, even if there is some kind of foreign death warrant on my head, I'm fairly sure I'll be quite safe in broad daylight. I don't know, assassinate... Was John F. Kennedy's in the daylight? I forgot my history. Going back, but what if that's what they want me to think? What if broad daylight is actually when I'm in the most danger? An assassin could blend into the crowd easily. Yes, like Ezio Auditore. No, perhaps I'm just getting a little paranoid. I must have to become one with my xenophobia. I just have to become one with my xenophobia and stay away from anyone with an accent or unusual features like you. That should do the trick. But chocolates from Pruivia are just so superb, and the cakes from the Cotarian capital are to die for. I bet they are to die for. 
Us so foreigners tend to have a lot more interesting stories to tell. Ah, I'm hopeless. I'm sorry I can't be a raving nationalist like you, father. I love how there's even noises for the door. After I finish getting ready, I head back over to the door and slip out into the hallway. <laughs> Was that my stomach? Oh, right. I suppose I haven't eaten since my snack during the carriage ride last evening. Well, I'm sure they have food in the festival stalls. I wind my way through the corridors and trot down the stairs, returning to the main hall while I while keeping my eyes peeled for any would-be attackers. It seems though like most of the guests have already like most of the guests have already gone outside, although a few are still milling about in this ridiculously large foyer. I stay on careful alert for that demonic woman too, whose threat rivals any assassin. Oh, is that the one who's been hounding you? Girl, I relate. As I saunter towards the door, I notice a very sexy man! Yes! Intently reading a long scroll. As in very intently, he looks about as focused on that paper as a starving dog with a bone. My curiosity wins out over my up refined upbringing and I quietly approach behind him to try and sneak a glimpse of whatever's on the scroll. Hmm. Before I can so much as catch a word, he abruptly spins to face me. A pair of hawk-like eyes behind angular glasses flick down to bare holes through my face. Um, I was just going to pick some lint off your shoulder, you see. Is that so? Oh! No! I don't think I've been given such an icy glare. Since I told my mother she looked fat in one of her dresses. Ah, uh, yes. Headed out to the festival and all that. Just spotted something on that coat of yours. My. How remarkably thoughtful you are. Okay, now you sound like a I condescending don't asshole. I you're one of the servants trying to masquerade as a nobleman. Oh, you now you really sound like an asshole. You mean you don't recognize me? He rolls his eyes at me, pushing up the bridge of his glasses with a light snort. I am a busy man. Why would I bother learning the name of someone who goes around picking lint off of people? I wince. This fellow really doesn't pull his punches. I guess I've been spoiled from all this random attention I've been getting. There's no way everyone would know my face just because I've been seen around with my old man. I'm Rivian. Varison, that is. The only response I get is an impassive stare. I said I'm, oh for hell's sake, the son of the old military strategist. Ah, that Verison. At my clarification, his eyes finally light up in recognition. Is there really more than one Verison? He's definitely mocking me. Well, why didn't you say so sooner? I would have let you pick lint off of me to your heart's content. Oh my god, you sound like an asshole! Can you stop with the lint business? I was fibbing, if you must know. Really? You could have fooled me. If I was five years old, perhaps. Oh, you savage bitch! However, regardless of how pitiful a liar you may be, His Majesty informed me to thank you for your attendance at the festivities and sends your father his regards. Hold on. I'm gonna make him the title card and call him a savage. Fuck you. His Majesty, wait, the king told you that directly? Of course. You seem surprised that the Grand Inquisitor would have contact with his employer. Oh, you're the Grand Inquisitor! Bitch. What is Inquisitor, the head of domestic investigations, doing at a royal celebration? I know what your unsophisticated mind is thinking. Why is the head of domestic investigations at a royal celebration? Oh my god, you sound well, like a bitch! My occupation requires me to be present at such important events. You sound like such a jerk! I hate you already! Well, I can see how he got his job. 
Now that I think about it, though, haven't I heard this man before? Uh, what was his name again? I remember. The Grand Inquisitor, hmm. Linnaeus, was it? That's correct. I see you store some useful information in that blonde, nearly empty head. Oh place. my god! Stop! Oh, please, lord! Gods, talk about unpleasant. Did snooping over his shoulder really warrant this kind of treatment? Clearly, the king tolerates him for qualities other than his horrible personality. Just out of curiosity, did his majesty tell you to thank every guest like that, or just me? His nose wrinkles despair disparagingly at my question, upper lip curling, no doubt in preparation to offer some kind of caustic response. Many guests are given honorific greetings, but for some unfathomable reason, he asked me specifically to address you. Why, does the king want to kill me? Plot twist! He sounds sign slightly confused, which is admittedly understandable. I see. For some reason, a strange sense of apprehension flits over me. The king singled out the Grand Inquisitor, one of his highest-ranking men, to talk to me. Beyond that, he investigates domestic affairs. That means if something fishy is going on related to the king or his court, this ponytailed hell beast is on the hunt. I hope he's not being assigned to keep an eye on me or something. This is one man who I would rather not get on the bad side of. Incidentally, do you know how many foreign guests the king invited to this extravagant affair? Linnaeus raises his eyebrows at my question, then narrows his hawk-like gaze at me. There are no more than six, with four of those being ambassadors. All of them equally dislikable, if you ask me. Do you find anyone likable, except for your reflection? Oh my god, no! Bur Hold on! Shit! Burns! Everywhere! Perhaps I'd like you, if you are more like your father and less of a spoiled child. I'm starting to wonder what the sentence is for punching the what's the sentence is for punching the Grand Inquisitor. Ah, your primitive mind is contemplating violence, is it not? I advise you not to raise a hand against me. Not even the Varison name will save you from the consequences. <clears throat> With a defeated growl, I turn to the doors with intent to head off before I end up getting thrown another insult. Oh, before you head off to cause more trouble. I begrudgingly cast a glance over my shoulder to see an annoyed look on the Inquisitor's face. If you see that ridiculous boy, Arden, is it? Tell him he needs to act like a proper guardsman. Or I'll make sure he's relieved of his post. You know Arden? Lovely, what on earth did he do now? Linnaeus waves his hand dismissively at me, pulling back out the scroll he tucked away when he noticed my presence earlier. Ask him yourself. I have no further time to entertain your dull questioning. Dull? Very well. I'd pull up a chair for you before I left, but sitting down would surely drive the stick buried in your rectum to an uncomfortable death. Oh! <laughs> oh, Rivy, shush! Lord! I can feel the murderous glare turn trained on my back as I hastily make my way out of the castle doors, not wanting to suffer the inevitable retaliation that'd occur if I stuck around. Plus the cool breeze hits my face, and I enter into the lavish grounds outside, I breathe a sigh of relief. With luck, I'll never have to run into that unpleasant man again. More importantly, I can see the bustling festival stalls ahead, and excitement bubbles inside me as I follow the stream of guests he heading towards them. I don't think I've ever been to a proper festival. Maybe I'll have a chance to get some fun souvenirs and actually relax a little. <coughs> Perhaps... Perhaps this celebration won't be so bad after all. Hold on. Ah, oh, what a sight indeed! For a market set up just for this occasion, I find myself awed by the beauty and size of it. 
rows upon rows of vendors, probably common folk dressed up in fancier clothes by his majesty's orders, sing and cajole to sell their wares. The air is rich with scents of spices, sweets, and perfumes, all of them competing for dominance. I hope I don't get into a sneezing fit. Raising a hand above my eyes to shield him from the sun, I scan the crowds for Arden as I walk. I can't seem to spot his over-eager self anywhere, though. Maybe it's just further along. Let's see. Two of those, one of those, or maybe three of those. Stopping at an exotic cart that sells food from a place I can't pronounce, I pick an array of... I pick an array of things to serve as my breakfast. I stuff my arms with a variety of treats and munch thoughtfully while meandering along with the, the crowd. The silks from ports all over the world. Come, drink yourself in the shawl of a queen. There's candy and herbs and medicines to make the sickly into the strong. Or perhaps the opposite to your foes. Buy the best vintage of our royal highness's favorite wine. Pressed from the kingdom's best grapes. Ah, domestic product among all these imported ones. Who really cares if it's the king's favorite wine, though? Wine's only good for getting drunk. It could taste like boiled boots as long as it gets the job done. Hasn't been to a wine tester, that's for sure. As I head through the street, someone suddenly bumps up against my side. Someone picked your pocket! <laughs> oh, excuse me. A delicate female voice comes from beside me, and I quickly turn to see a pretty girl curtsying apologetically, and she is really pink. Her skin tone is pink, for fuck's sake. What the hell is that? I beg your pardon, sir. It's very hard walking in these shoes all day, and I'm starting to get a bit wobbly. <laughs> I glance down at her shoes. Ouch, those heels are razor thin and obscenely tall. Poor woman. I should be the one to apologize. I suppose I'm rather spoiled, getting to plod around in these comfy boots all day. I'm sorry, I had to check out something, but yeah. But that's a charming response, Ruby. A happy grin spreads on the lady's lips at my remark. I can tell from her fine clothes and mannerisms that she's one of the king's guests, not someone here to sell wares. I'll keep a an eye on where I'm going next time. <laughs> oh, she sounds oh, fun. By the way, I'm looking for someone. Uh, I wonder if you might have seen him. What a twist of fate. I'm looking for someone too. What's yours look like? Let's see. Um, he's an older gentleman with a red coat and a rather round nose and a bit on the larger side. I pause thoughtfully, racking my mind for a similar image to what she's describing. I come up with a blank, however, and regretfully shake my head. I'm afraid not. I'll tell him you were looking for him if I see someone with such a physique, though. Would you? Ah, oh, I'd be most grateful. <laughs> Please tell him Celeste wants to speak with him. Celeste, is it? If you see an ungraceful oaf with... Oh, speak of the devil. Before I can even finish my flattering description of Arden, I spot him eagerly pushing through the crowd towards me, waving a hand over his head. Oh, is he your friend? Ah, uh, he's quite handsome. She giggles coyly, giving Arden quite the intense once-over as she, he approaches us out of breath. Rivian! I knew you'd come out of hiding sooner or later. He doesn't even seem to notice Celeste at first, but when I pointedly nudge my chin slightly in her direction, Arden glances down towards the girl. Please excuse me, I need to go find Papa before he gets swindled by too many merchants. <laughs> Perhaps I'll see you tonight, Rivian. Despite addressing her words to me, she's clearly eyeing Arden as she drops in another cute curtsy, gracefully slipping back into the Papa, crowd. Huh? Wonder if she means her real father, or a thirsty widower she's ensnared between her thighs. Ah, oh, Rivi, calm down! Uh, you two friends? Arden, you... You very clueless jit. We literally just met about two minutes ago, Arden. I was actually looking for you, though. I trail off, figuring it's probably not the best idea to add as a meat shield against many assassins. Unsurprisingly, Arden's eyes light up. 
If I didn't bear a grudge against him, I'd find it rather cute. Look, we're blocking traffic. Come on. I push his shoulder forward with one hand, steering him along as we stroll forward past the stalls. Looks a little strange, Riv. Is something bothering you? Did you buy spoiled food off one of the merchants by accident? I hesitate, casting an uncertain glance over at Arden's curious expression. Franz's words from last night are still lurking in the back of my mind, and sharing them with someone would certainly make me feel a little more at ease. However, it's been four years since I last saw Arden. For I know he could have gotten even worse at keeping his mouth shut than he already was. No, no, don't worry about it. There was something I did want to ask you, though. What did you do to upset the Grand Inquisitor? I don't think I've ever met a more unpleasant man in my life. At that, Arden's eyes widen, his expression suddenly growing sheepish. Oh, him? He's even worse than you are, Riv. I thought he was going to chop my head off just for leaving my room at night. Wow, the accent really shifted. He must have really been pissed with the <laughs> Grand Inquisitor. What? You mean guests aren't allowed to leave <coughs> their rooms? No, they are. It's just... Well, I was just nosying around places I wasn't supposed to, probably. Nosying? Well, if that's not an Arden-esque thing to do, I don't know what is. He looks a little uncomfortable, though. I wonder what kind of place Linnaeus found you him don't in. act anything like how a royal guard ought to, you know. Just because you're off duty for a week doesn't mean you can stir up mischief as you please. I know that! I'm older than you, Riv. You can't scold me like a kid. I'd beg to differ. Oh, how wrong you are. The bright morning turns into a warm afternoon as we explore the market, purchasing no small amount of food and curious trinkets. Before I know it, I'm carrying around a bag made from exotic leather, with an assortment of colognes, books, and fine souvenirs tucked inside. Of course, I wind up convincing Arden to carry the bag. He needs to put the muscles he's built from all that training to good use, after all. He seems exhilarated that we're spending time together like we used to, but the only reason I'm enduring his company is so that I don't make myself an easy target. I will admit, it does bring back memories of happier times, but those times are long gone. And now I'm caught up in some political game that's far more important than drowning myself in nostalgia. Look, Riff! Snake Charmer! Damn! Wish I had that kind of skill. Arden's excited voice besides me directs my attention to a man seated on a carpet nearby, surrounded by a thick circle of murmuring admirers. I bet your legs are getting sore from all this walking anyway. Excuse me. Just because I'm not a royal guardsman doesn't mean I'm out of shape. Despite my protests, I let Arden tug me over to the snake trauma and we push our way into the audience to get a better view. The sound of the strange flute-like instrument he's playing seems to make the serpent perform him sway and shift, its leathery body rising into a somewhat disconcerting height. I watch for a little while, but boredom soon overcomes me, and I turn to search for Arden and drag him off. Arden? It seems you're still a little careless about leaving your back exposed. Someone suddenly presses against me from behind, and a low chuckle echoes in my ears. A familiar, sensual voice! <laughs> the rough rasp of large hands on my shoulders. This is... What the hell are you doing here? Stalking more victims? Oh, that's rather cold, isn't it? <gasps> I've been keeping an eye on you. Let's just say that much. Those words alone are more than a little unnerving. Who is this man? If you want a few more details, you'll have to leave your friend behind for a few moments. But the choice is yours, little kitten. After whispering those warm words against my ear, he steps back and I quickly turn to see him beckoning me with a curled finger. Shit! I follow! As much as I loathe the idea of scampering after friends like the lost kitten he seems to think of me as, I want some answers from him. Silently apologizing to Arden in my head, I weave through the crowd and follow the tall figure, waits for me to catch up before continuing on. 
Good. I'm glad you're being sensible. Besides, you don't really enjoy that boring guard's company, do you? You know about Arden too? He must be building quite an unflattering reputation for himself. The corners of Francis' lip curl slightly upwards, his thumbs hooked casually into his pockets as we stroll towards a less populated part of the festival. His reputation is not as poor as you might think. He did get into the Royal Guard, an elite unit, through remarkably hard work, and attracted quite a bit of attention. I don't know him personally, of course. I simply keep abreast of pertinent information. I watch his movements from the corner of my eye as he speaks, trying to discern anything that might reveal information about where he's from or his occupation. He's certainly tall and well-built enough to be a fighter of some kind, but his elegant speech and smooth movements lead me to believe he's related to, related to noble politics somehow. Regardless, it seems like you've been heeding my warning. I tried your bedroom door last night just to make sure it was locked. Uh, what? I should report you to the guards you know! Next thing, you'll be smashing through the balcony doors. Come now. Do you really want to act so callously against one of the few people who can keep you safe? I promise, I have your best interests at heart. I shoot him a disgruntled look as we come to a halt behind the last festival stall on the street, where the chattering of the bustling crowd grows, sounds distant. You've been spouting all this nonsense and acting like some grand benefactor, but I don't have any reason to believe a word of what you say. Hey. Isn't it a little ironic that the most disturbing encounter I've had so far has been with you? No one's pulled a knife on me or given me any reason to mistrust them. Except you. My accusation seems to bounce off Franz, who folds his arms impassively over his massive chest and watches me with a tilted head. A hint of a smirk stays on his face, which can surely only mean bad things. I guess it'd be rather hypocritical for me to tell you to be on your guard around others, but not give you a reason to trust me, hmm? A little kitten learns fast. I swear if you're my you uncle, I will flip my shit. With this kitten nonsense. It might work on some shy maiden, but I assure you I'm nothing of the sort. Really? I could have sworn I felt your heart pounding like a little war drum when I had you <gasps> pinned in my arms last night. <clears throat> However, returning to the subject at hand, there are a number of reasons I could give as to why I want to help you, but I doubt you'd believe any of them at this point. But if you want proof as to the fact that this celebration and its guests are more than they seem, I believe the occurrence I spoke of earlier will happen no later than tonight. The occurrence? Could you be any more vague? Franz shrugs lightly, running a hand through his hair. You've played chess before, haven't you? You see the opponent's pieces moving, but a skilled player often masks what they're planning. The best you can do is stay alert. The keen light in his eyes suggests that he definitely knows more than he's letting on. Damn it, what I wouldn't give to be a cold calculating bastard like you right now, father. I'd see through him in a second. Then I'll reserve judgment until I see for myself what's afoot. Afterwards, I'll decide if you're a delusional pervert or just an exceptionally well-informed one. Hold on. Sorry guys, I just needed to check something real quick. As expected of Lord Verison's son. I trust we'll encounter each other tonight, then. Tonight. Whoa, don't get so close to me. He steps closer, leaning in to press a finger under my chin and gaze that down at me with those uncomfortably discerning eyes. Oh, you can dissect me anytime. Ooh. Until then, stay on your toes. The most painful attacks come from the most unexpected of places. 
I glower up at Franz silently in reply, which only serves to elicit a low laugh from him as he steps past me. Ah, those eyes send sweet shivers down my spine. Well, good <laughs> afternoon, the... my little lord. Who are you? And I like how you tell me that it makes you shiver. Sorry, I'm really thirsty. I need a glass of water. He disappears around the edge of the stall, presumably returning to the street, and I sigh quietly to myself as his footsteps fade. I don't know why, but I feel like it... I wasn't a victor in that conversation, even though I wasn't even aware we were in a contest. Regardless of his intentions, I don't think I'll ever get used to that man's demeanor. It's like dealing with a male escort or something. You know, it really is, because I've dealt with a lot of male escorts back then. Because I was a manager of some sort, I'll tell you about ga that guy's at some other time. Sulking a little to myself, I head back to the street, returning in the direction Franz and I had come from. When I return to the snake charmer, I catch Arden wandering around searching for me and tell him I went off to relieve myself in some bushes. He gives me a somewhat dubious look at my excuse, but doesn't question it. Well, it's none of his business anyway, he'd probably pop a vein if I told him too much about Franz. After bantering a bit, we decide to return to our rooms for a rest before the dinner and dance take place in the evening. We start strolling through the stalls in the opposite direction towards the, in the direction of the castle. We buy a few more small things on the way and I manage to get my hands on a rather nice emerald studded brooch for my mother. By the time we arrive back at the castle entrance, it's already turning to late afternoon. The sun's golden shape gradually descending in the west. I part ways with Arden, denying his request for me to show him my room and hurry back up to the second floor. Dumping my bag of miscellaneous purchases on top of my clothes trunk, I pull my boots off and throw myself onto the luxurious bed of a, with a soft groan. Despite how tired I am from all that walking around, a strange tension won't leave my body. I won't go as far as to say it's a feeling of foreboding, but it's as if some sixth sense is how I have this tingling, rather ominously. It's all that bastard Franz's fault, making me all paranoid. Wallowing languidly in my self pity, I sprawl out over the nestling against my pillow and letting out a deep sigh. I'm sure it doesn't matter if I fall asleep, since Silas will probably come back to wake me up. It's pretty impressive that he manages to remember a single guest among the hundreds who must be here. It's gonna be the butler! Skill of a royal butler, I suppose. I close my eyes and try to catch a little rest. Slot. However, I can't manage to slip into more than a light doze, tossing and turning from side to side. Either from lingering excitement or apprehension, I'm too restless to fall into a deep sleep. There's been too much stimulation today for an introvert like me, damn it. I probably haven't talked to so many peop different people in years. <sighs> it's no use. Opening my eyes, I grudgingly pull myself up into a sitting position, staring through the balcony doors into the evening sky. A part of me wants to go out and lean on the balustrade, but I'd rather avoid a repeat of last night. <gasps> As I sit on my bed contemplating what to do, a knock suddenly comes at my door. I slide off onto the floor and stride over to open it, but hesitate. It's probably just Silas, but what if it's someone who... Have some balls, man. God's sake. Scolding myself quietly, I pull the door open, although I take a little step back just to be safe. Who are you? Uh. Before me stands a young man, probably a couple of years my junior. I definitely don't recognize him. Why is he staring at me like I just morphed into a monster? S sorry sir, I g g got the wrong room. Oh, well don't worry about it. Looking for someone in particular? J j just Miss Celeste? His stuttering while perhaps cute at first is quickly getting on my nerves. Celeste you say? I think I may have met her earlier. 
I didn't know she was in the same hall as me. I, I thought she was, but maybe not. I'll go find her. S sorry again. Right. I watch as he scampers off down the corridor, hastily examining all the other room numbers. What an odd boy. He's never... He's either very shy or completely out of sorts for some reason. I wonder how he knows Celeste. I'll have to ask her the next time I run into her. Plot twist, she's dead first day. Well, seeing as there's not much else for me to do, I might as well take a little stroll around the castle before I head downstairs. I stuff my hands in my pockets and mosey around the hallway corner, making sure there's not an odd and lurking in wait. It seems to be clear, so I wander down the, hall ne down the next hall with a relieved exhale. I make my way towards the general direction of the main hall, but with the occasional detour to admire tapestries and small alcoves decorated with paintings and plush chairs. There are probably a lot of interesting nooks and crannies in this place. After all, the king is known for his love of collecting things, including apparently collecting a bunch of foreigners who hate the Varison bloodline. Mm -hmm. Is that a person over there or a statue? Either way, they look very intent in whatever they read. Oh, no, no, no. As quietly as possible, I start to back away, praying not to be noticed. It's him. Ow! Oh, God damn it. Shit! Damn, that sque these squeaky floorboards. I freeze in place as the tall figure turns towards me, glasses flashing in the light. Is that the little lint picker looking to creep up on me again? Talk about holding a grudge. Deciding it's probably best to be polite rather than doing too much to get on his bad side, I clear my throat. <clears throat> Inquisitor, I was just heading down to the main hall. Linnaeus' eyes glint behind his glasses as he closes the book in his hand and saunters towards me. Hmm. I could have sworn there's a much simpler way to get to the main hall than through this back passage. Well, I was exploring a little, you know. It's a shame to have all this fine art and no one to view it. Huh. After a scornful laugh, he taps a finger on the unmarked cover of his book, watching me suspiciously. I brace myself for what's undoubtedly an accusation, tensing slightly. <sighs> I suppose I owe you an apology. Well, that's unexpected. What? I tap the side of my head, wondering if he my hearing's gone bad. Linnaeus let out a <laughs> in response, his eyes narrowing. I was... perhaps... excessively rude earlier. There was an unexpected occurrence this morning that had... put me in something of a foul mood. It seems bizarre- Occurrence?! Wait a minute! It seems bizarre of him to be actually remorseful. Is he trying to make fun of me? I narrow my eyes at him slightly, trying to judge his intentions. Eh, let's be nice. The better party. Unexpected or not, I doubt whether what really just whether that really justifies his behavior. But he does appear to be earnest about his apology, even if reluctantly well, so. Let it not be said, I am an ungracious man. I was probably a little rude back then too, though not as rude as you were, certainly. Self voicing. Do disabled. not push your luck, Verison. Let us put the matter to rest and move on. Yes, just calm down, Jesus Christ. His fingers switch against his book. Not wanting to be hit with or otherwise assaulted with the heavy looking tome, I concede with a nod of my head. Are you heading down as well? Are Grand Inquisitors free to mingle and dance with us common folk? Go! There's a night of the waste to say this. While my presence here is as a guest of His Majesty, I do not consider myself to ever be off duty. I guess that's what that explains your apprehension with. Arden. After all, it is not as if treasonous men stop being treasonous during pleasant gatherings. If anything, the risk is higher. Despite his haughty tone, it's hard to deny that he really does take his job seriously. I suppose it's one of those positions that doesn't allow much time for rest. Linnaeus turns and motions for me to follow him down the corridor, setting off in a brisk pace in the direction for the main hall. 
I catch up to his side and glance at his severe looking profile, his eyes constantly scrutinizing the world around him from behind those glasses. If you follow in your father's footsteps and wind up in his highness's ring of advisors, it is best we learn to tolerate each other. He pauses for a moment, then, his voice suddenly growing a little more hesitant. There are many in his circle who I find to be of questionable nature. But nonetheless, it is not my duty to speak against his decisions. I hope you didn't consider father to be of questionable nature. Sighs so flick down towards me sharply. I meet his gaze as best as I can, even though that hawkish stare is quite difficult to be the subject of. He is a man possessed of exceptional perceptiveness. Enough so to rival my own. That is all I shall say. I'll make sure to tell him. I'm sure he'd appreciate a compliment from a man like you. Do I sense sarcasm in your voice? Need I remind you of our truce? <laughs> oh, guys, calm down, both of you. I press my lips doubtfully. True or not, I doubt he'll be inclined to hold back from insulting me if I slip up somewhere. This man is vicious. We emerge at the balcony of the main hall, where it seems guests are starting to gather in their formal attire. I noticed the girl from earlier, Celeste, was it? Standing next to an older, slightly rotund man, chatting happily. Her father, I wonder? The doors to the dining hall are soon opened by well-dressed attendants, and I walk with Linnaeus into Rado's magnificent room. Oh, is that the Grand Inquisitor? Who's daddy's with? Are they brothers? Uh, I want to marry a man like that, Regal. Sounds like the Inquisitor is rather popular. I guess it makes sense, he's quite young, but he already holds one of the most important positions in court. After destroying the potential rivals, will will to live in crushing their position, no doubt. The superficiality of court never fails to disgust me. I long for the day when a man is judged by his actions rather than his outward appearance. Me too. I hate to tell you this, but you'll be longing for that day until you die. If appearances didn't matter here, we'd all be wearing burlap bags. Perhaps you should be the trendsetter, hmm? A burlap bag on your head would undoubtedly be an improvement. Well, I set myself up for that one. We get closer to the massive table and it seems like there's no predetermined seating. Something unusual for an event of this caliber. But maybe the king wants a more relaxed atmosphere. Guests seem to be sitting down with their friends and relatives, and there seem to be a few blushing courtships in progress before even the soup is served. <sighs> I spot Arden already seated, looking rather uncomfortable and surrounded by what looks like a bunch of old ladies. Aunts, maybe? His grandmother definitely did pop out quite a few daughters, if I remember correctly. There's no free seating around him, although it's not like I need another dose of Arden again so soon anyway. Well... I assume there are individuals who would appreciate your company more than myself. So, this is presumably where we part ways. I turn to see Linnaeus staring past me idly, his eyes following the servants skittering around about with preparations. You've already got a seat in mind? Not particularly. If I find one with a view of the dining room I like, I shall politely request its occupant to vacate. What does that mean? A rather sadistic glint shining through the lights of his glasses. Talk about the abuse of power. Well, when you're far from my ideal dinner partner, but I don't see anyone else I know around, and I'd rather not be sought out by a certain lady from last night. I grimace that saccharine cooing replaying itself all too vividly in my ears. Flattering. Have you already been caught up in my suave charm like those admirers from earlier? All right, let's eat. You have about as much charm as a pile of bricks, I remark silently to myself, following Linnaeus over to a vacant set of seats. We settle down in our surprisingly comfortable chairs, neither of us inclined to share many more words as we wait for the meal to begin. 
Just as I begin reciting poetry in my head out of sheer boredom, the empty chair in my, by my side opposite Linnaeus is suddenly pulled out. Thrilled at the idea of a potentially more exciting conversation partner, I quickly cast a welcoming smile upwards. Oh, greetings, my name is... Who is it? <laughs> Don't you think I know your name? Don't you think I know your name? <laughs> A tall tan man lowers himself into the seat beside me, pulling himself up close, a wide and wolfish grin on his lips. Oh, Fortuna, why must you torture me so? As Franz chuckles contently and leers at me, Linnaeus, who was watching something in the distance, suddenly turns his attention towards us. Oh? I was under the impression you had no friends, Verison. Other than your father, and that... Oh, for the god. Oh, for the god. the farthest thing from a friend, let me tell you. A scrutinizing gleeful glimmer fills Linnaeus's glasses visibly. Ah, I see, I see. Well, we do live in a progress... Oh shit, sorry. I audibly grind my teeth together while Franz lets out a delighted laugh, taking those words as his cue to curl his arm around my shoulders. Maybe I'll get lucky and someone will poison my wine while I'm not looking. I'm over here, assassins. Yoo-hoo! You hear that? Nothing wrong with giving in to your desires. However, it is entirely inappropriate for Varys and son to frolic with an obvious foreigner. You should cease such disgusting actions okay. immediately. Linnaeus' voice suddenly grows much frostier, a clear look of mistrust on his sharp features as he watches Franz, lip curled in distaste. To my surprise, the broad smirk on Franz's face suddenly flickers a little, his own expression darkening somewhat. He glances over Linnaeus for a moment, in what's pro probably the first time I've seen him look annoyed. Grand Inquisitor, right? I see the king has played one of his trump cards a little early. A trump card? Why in heaven's name would he need to do that? I think you know as well as I do, Inquisitor. But I'm sure you've got everything under control. <sighs> I, swear, I swear, I feel like I'm sitting between two cannons pointed at each other. The sudden animosity in the air is thicker than a bowl of uncooked porridge. Should I do something before it explodes? Wait! Save! My ass! Yes. How long have I been recording? It's almost an hour, for fuck's sake. Uh, ah, look! They're bringing the food out, finally! I'm completely famished, aren't you two? <laughs> Oh, this is a desperate mm. bid! <sighs> Anais? <laughs> Guys, calm down, for fuck's sake. We're all on the same side here. They continue to glow at each other, even as the servants place an array of tantalizing platters in front of us, filled with dishes of both vegetables and meat. Wow, they brought desserts too! My goodness, look at all that cake! I'm almost tempted to skip the main courses! I have a lot- I see a lot of cake on your left, Rivy! To my immense relief, Franz pulls away from the staring contest first, his gaze shifting from Linnaeus to me. The lingering antagonism in his stare makes me cringe a little, considering I'm accustomed to his usual bedroom eyes. Oh, there they are. That iciness quickly melts away, however, and he reaches out to squeeze my shoulder with unnerving intimacy. Yes! for the sweet, they say. You should eat all the cake you like, kitten. It'll make your lips taste sublime. Sure. <gasps> I would go for a flirty man with a serious side any day. He starts to pick up from a few dishes to fill his plate, coming to himself in a show of nonchalance. What irresponsible advice? Replenish your energy properly with a balanced meal, Varison. Are you guys trying to vie for my attention? Chiding me with a click of his tongue, Linnaeus also reaches forward to elegantly serve himself some of the spread before us, casting a quick side glance in my direction. The tension clearly remains hanging between them, but 
just because they're acting all hot, it doesn't mean I should starve myself. Though, whose advice should I follow? I feel like they're gonna have me choose. This is ridiculous. I love it. I eye the dishes, contemplating whether to splurge or not. Do I have two choices or three? I believe in a proper meal, but... I want to tantalize. Damn, that whipped cream is simply just too enticing. I pull up the slice of cake in front of me, sighing happily. This is what it means to be an adult. Oh, is that your shy little way of saying you want to kiss after all? Oh, sweet tooth! Achievement unlocked! And calm down! Smirking rather victoriously, Franz wipes a bit of cream off the cake with his finger and licks it off in the lewdest manner I can imagine. Were you fellating your finger? Disgusting. And you're no better, you know. What would your father think? His razor sharp glare directed at me now, Linnea shakes his head disparagingly and takes an irritated bite of bread. I wince a little while nibbling a bite of cake off my fork, deciding not to retort any further than fat and further fan of flames. Oh, by the way, have either of you picked out your costumes for the masquerade yet? I forgot to look for a mask today. Well, hold on, I'm just gonna leave it here guys for a moment. I'll come back to it. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you guys soon. Bye for now.